Uh, hi everyone, thank you for the introduction and thank you for organizing this nice conference. So my name is Sarah I'm a PhD student at uh, Sorbonne and Thales. And I study the security of um, UOV-based schemes, so multi cryptography, mostly uh, schemes, uh, signature schemes that are submitted to the NIST call for uh, additional signatures. To give you a, a rough idea of where we're going, um, the, the secret key of UOV will, will be some set of uh, vectors that define a, a secret subspace. And they are solutions of some polynomial systems. The question is, uh, there are other solutions. Can I distinguish between those solutions and the secret vectors? So let's get started. Um, in mutual crypto, we look at quadratic equations, quadratic systems of, uh, of equations, because this is a very hard problem. So very generally, we'll consider systems of m quadratic equations in n variables over a finite field fq. You can see that this problem is hard, in the worst case at least, because it reduces to sat. So typically, if you choose q equal to, you have uh, an instance of sat. This also works for bigger fields, of course, and more, general, more generally for any degree of equations. We build crypto from this kind of problem, like we usually do. The public key will be an instance of the hard problem that we don't know how to solve efficiently, and the secret key should enable the signer to find some solutions of instances related to this public key. In our case, we will be able to solve some system that is slightly offset from the public key uh, system. The, the main feature of, uh, of, of UV is that it's rather easy to introduce. So in general, any quadratic equation, you can see it has a quadratic form, and so you can represent it uh, rather synthetically using matrices, square matrices. So for this small example, you can look at this, and you simply write your unknown vi variable vector x, so here x, y, and you can multiply on the left and on the right to obtain simply your equation. So the main takeaway is that, of course, this generalizes uh, for uh, larger uh, systems, but essentially, if you have some structure in your equations, you will have some structure in your matrices. This is the, more or less the approach that is followed in, uh, in the study of U of V. So let's speak about U of V now. U of V is a scheme that was introduced in 1999 by Kitnis, Patarin, and Goubin. It is based on a scheme by Patarin from 86. And the idea here is that the trap door we have will be the knowledge of some easy polynomial system that we call uh, F. And it is easy because you can efficiently find a solution of the system. The secret system is linear in m variables, x1 through xm, and m out of m. And this means that you can efficiently solve it. To obtain the public key, so uh, just for some notations, this, this m variables, we call them the oil variables. This is where the oil comes from. The vinegar variables are the remaining n minus m variables. To obtain the public key, you, you give also yourself a random uh, general variables that you call a. You choose it uniformly at random. And you compose the secret system with the, this uh, general variables to obtain your public key. And the, the feature of, uh, of this uh, scheme is that so you, you really see the uh, structure of the secret key in the matrices of the secret key. There's a block of zeros in your matrices. And it appears to have disappeared from your public key. So without the knowledge of, of this uh, transform A, you are unable to solve the system efficiently. And I'll mention that from uh, an algebraic point of view, this, this appears to actually work uh, also a bit uh, more uh, theoretically than uh, simply with this visualization. If you are familiar with polynomial systems, the system reached uh, the Macaulay bound, so it, it appears as if uh, they were truly uh, random. Some conventions. So, as I was said before, we obtain signatures uh, by finding uh, the solution of some system. Um, you obtain them easily if you know A, and you are unable to, solve, to obtain them without solving a hard system otherwise. And you have to, to respect some, uh, some parameters, some uh, restrictions on the parameters, to have a secure scheme. So the first constraint you have is, uh, is based on the so-called kipnitz shamir attack. It tells you that you must have more vinegar variables than oil variables, otherwise the scheme is broken. And then you have a soft limit, which is an upper bound on number of variables, because you can see that the, um, the size of the keys is more or less uh, quadratic or even cubic in the number of variables. So you want to limit this size. So for this reason, you will usually be in parameter regimes where you have this inequality enforced, but this is mostly, so the upper bound is mostly for the key sizes. So speaking of performances, uh, UOV is a rather attractive scheme for uh, post-quantum crypto because it has very small signatures, very efficient signature time, and also verification. You can convince yourself that the signatures are small uh, rather easily. The, the field Q is rather small, and you simply have this uh, vector that is the signature. To give you some parameters for reference, um, you can see that the main drawback of UOV is the size of the keys. So I mentioned before that we have some uh, questions of efficiency. Here you can see that, well, your signature sizes are almost competitive with uh, classical crypto, but your key sizes are very large. And you use a lot of tricks, so you also actually compress the public key 
in, uh, in practice to communicate it, but it still, it still remains rather big. So the formulation I gave you of UOV is very, uh, very simple. It's very practical if you want to implement the scheme, implement the signature process and verification process, but it's not so handy if you want to study the cryptanalysis of the scheme. If you want to study it like uh, with the previous formulation, you have to focus on the algebraic aspects, that is finding some zeros of some polynomial systems or finding some relations that give uh, coefficients equal to zero. And actually, the main insight that we have from uh, the Kipnitz Shamir attacks from 98 and also from the work of World Balance is that if you, if you add a geometric interpretation of your scheme, it's much easier to analyze. And you can get very simple attacks that, uh, that are harder to explain algebraically alone. So in our case, we will rephrase this secret to door, which was uh, the change of variables and the secret form of the system, in, in the form of a secret subspace. And the subspace is a subspace of, uh, so the vectors on this subspace will vanish our equations when you consider them as quadratic forms or bilinear forms. So essentially you have this, this uh, identity that is verified. And of course, this is highly non-generic. So if you take a random system, there is no such uh, subspace, at least not as big. So this really uh, encapsulates the, the secret key of you. The first observation, the sanity check, is that this is equivalent to the previous formulation. So if you know the secret change variables A, you can obtain a, a basis of O. And O will be called the oil space also in the literature. The second observation is that all the vectors in this secret subspace are signatures for the message zero. So over there, if you replace the y by x, you see that you have a solution of the system. But what's important is that there are more signatures of zero than uh, vectors in the subspace. So you, if you simply try to solve the system, you will not find vectors of O. With this in mind, we can uh, introduce the, the goals of, a, of an attacker, of a cryptanalyst trying to break the scheme and see its security. The most simple goal is forgery. So in this case, you are trying to find a signature for some message. And this frame, geometrically, it's finding a point in a variety of dimension m minus m, or algebraically, it's solving a polynomial system. That is what we call underdetermined. That is, you have more variables than constraints. A more general goal is the goal of key recovery, and it is what I'm interested in today. The idea here is to obtain a basis of O. That is an equivalent secret key that enables you to sign any message. In this case, the problem is different. You are looking for a linear subspace that is a subset of a variety. Notice here that the variety has dimension m minus m, and the linear subspace has dimension m. So if you only look at the dimensions, you already know that there is a mismatch. So there must be more signatures of zero than there are vectors in O. Uh, so let me introduce my contributions. So I don't break UOV. What I do is uh, I show you that I, I try to quantify the minimum amount of information that you need to recover a full secret key. So I show that if you know one vector in this secret subspace, you can obtain a full basis of this subspace in polynomial time. And so this polynomial time here, omega, is the concept of linear algebra. So this is rather efficient in terms of theory, but it is also efficient in practice. My implementation is very fast. And as a corollary of this, you can also decide, so this may be less obvious, that um, whether or not a signature of zero is part of the secret key. So this is a rather obvious corollary, but actually you can use some tricks to make it faster than simply applying the previous algorithm. So I also had the time for this. And, and this actually will be useful for, for the study of other schemes based on UOV. Actually, uh, yes. So uh, let me mention that there was some previous work in the context of such an attacks that achieved a, a very similar result. So the following team published uh, at CHEST last year, based on a remark by World Balance, they were able to obtain also a point time key recovery from one vector. Um, so essentially, um, the analysis is much more intricate for their attack. And by focusing on a, a geometric approach and on using only linear algebra, I'm able to obtain a, a more sharp complexity estimate and also a faster implementation. So how does it fit with the state of the art? I mentioned that this does not break UOV, and I'll try to explain why. So what we knew previously uh, that fits in this framework is called the reconciliation attack. The idea is that if you know some vectors of O, you are able to add some linear equations to some quadratic system and obtain an overdetermined system that is easier to solve than a, a generic quadratic system. But this is still a task that is exponential. You need to solve a quadratic system that can still be rather large. I I, what I do is that I improve the last step I tell you that once you know one vector, uh, then you are able to conclude in polynomial time. So you don't need to go through an exponential reconciliation. But again, this first step, finding uh, uh, the first vector in O, is considered to be the bottleneck in the security of UOV, and I do not improve this step. The algorithm is not so complicated, so I'll try to explain it. The idea is once again to focus on the geometric aspect of the, of the problem. We look again at the formulation of balance, and the idea here is to abstract a little further so here we are looking at some bilinear forms. The idea here will be to look at some specific linear forms that you can write down once you know one vector in O. In particular, you, 
only look at x transpose pi, which is uh, roughly the linear form that you obtain from the previous linear form. And notice that if you have a vector uh, in O, then O must be in the kernel of all these linear forms, and therefore also in the intersection of all these kernels. And the observation that kills the problem is that uh, the subspace J of X is, is smaller than, uh, than it should be. So this, this uh, intersection is generically of dimension M as M, and this will enable us to conclude. So essentially what you do once you have completed the subspace J of X is that you will restrict your public key system to this subspace alone. And this gives you a new UV instance, but you will have the same trapdoor. So this uh, new UV instance will still vanish on O or a subset of the same dimension, but you will have less variables. You will have only M as M variables. So essentially, if you want to visualize what's happening algebraically, you have some matrices with a block of zero in your secret key. This is your initial uh, UV key, and you restrict it to a small smaller uh, uh, vector space uh, FQ, M, S, M, but you keep the same size of trapdoor. And this means that uh, this matrix here has uh, not enough room, if you want, to have some independent rows. So here you will have uh, singular matrices in your restricted public, and the, this will be enough to conclude. So overall, what you do, first you compute this, uh, this kernel, that is the kernel of an MAN matrix, and this takes you uh, time MN2. Then you will compute the restrictions of your public key to, uh, to this subspace. This is the more or less tricky part, but this is only um, uh, matrix multiplications. So you will do it in a time related to the concept of inner algebra that I note omega here again. And finally, you know that, this, that these matrices have a, a rank defect. And this rank defect is caused by the vectors of the secret subspace. So we, you will compute the kernel of some of these matrices, all of them in the worst case, and you obtain what you want, that is a, a basis of O. So overall, you get a curve that is M and omega. Let me mention that in practice, you can really improve the M. M is the worst case scenario. In practice, these kernels are rather large, and so you expect uh, enough of them to be independent. So actually, you can do it in more or less free uh, kernel computations. So in practice, this will be a lot faster than M and omega. So the natural question is, how does this apply to the U of E based schemes? So here's a, an incomplete map of the submissions at NIST. And well, I'm mostly interested in multi uh, schemes. And I've got a, a connex component uh, over there on the left, which is what I call the UOV family. So these are the schemes I'm interested in, and I'm trying to apply my work to these. Some of these schemes use keys that are special instances of UOV. That is, you can consider them sp special cases. For these schemes, it's very easy to apply this work. And I'll mention that for Mayo, it was done by Ward uh, at the time when he submitted Mayo. For some of the schemes, like uh, GUOV and UOV hat plus, which gives Vox, this is not so obvious because the keys you use are not directly UOV keys. So you don't have a UOV instance. You have modified keys. So in my paper, I focused on UOV hat plus. I'm trying to give you a, an idea of how this works. So the hat plus transform is the following idea. You will replace some of your equations, the secret equations, by ran totally random equations. So you no longer have a trapdoor. And then you will mix everything. And this means that from, a, from the public keys point of view, you no longer have a linear subspace O that vanishes all your equations. So it appears as if the trapdoor has disappeared, at least from the perspective of an attacker. And, in, and the offers are good that you have to invert this first transform S before you are able to attack the scheme. With the tools I introduced in my paper, I found that if I want to achieve polynomial time, I will need to know a lot of vectors. A number T, so T is the number of random equations that I added in my secret key. The, so this tells you that you need the same number of vectors than you had random equations. This is not very satisfying because this is a lot more than what you need for UOV. And so in more recent work, I, uh, I relaxed this uh, polynomial time assumption. And I achieved essentially uh, uh, the same result for, than for UOV, but at the cost of an exponential time in this small parameter t. But actually, the cost that I have to pay for this test is not too big. It allowed me to improve the kinetic mirror attack. So it's an attack I mentioned before. That also applies to UOV hand plus in a, and that was a bit uh, optimistically underestimated by the offers of Vox, which allows me to obtain a, a more efficient attack that actually brought the scheme below the security levels. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, thank you for your attention. Question for Pierre? Uh, uh, just, just, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, you indicated that there were actually two unwrap candidates which were affected, UOV plus, and I missed the other one. Uh, yes, yeah, so actually, okay. 
Yeah, so I lied a bit. UV hat plus was not submitted to NIST. Uh, it's only only uh, Vox which was submitted to NIST. So just to give a bit more details, Vox is not just UV hat plus. Vox also uses uh, the QR transform, the Cauchy string transform, which is the idea is to do the same as for uh, lattices and to uh, structure your public key matrices instead of using uh, dense matrices. Uh, both transforms were attacked. There were, I think, at least three teams who attacked the QR transform in Vox very, very efficiently with practical attacks. The attack I mentioned is not practical. It is, it is still very expensive, at least two to 100 for the smallest part of the set. But uh, it only attacks the hat plus transform. And so, yeah, this work applies to essentially easily to the other blue schemes. And I have not already, and I have not adapted it to to UV yet. We have the time for uh, another short question. Okay, Pierre. So, what happened if I have not all the vector, but uh, a part of it now? Um, so you could. So this means that you could try uh, to. Um, to guess the remaining parts of the vector. Um, I have not uh, looked in this direction very, very long. So there are probably some systems that you can write exploiting the fact that you know part of the vector. You can try to naively uh, guess the remaining values. Or you can write some system, I believe, uh, following the ideas of Aragur, to write some systems with, uh, where you know that the noise is small enough. Then you can try to write some pretty more systems that will tell you that your vector is a solution or not of your system. But I, I am not convinced that this will be efficient. Maybe just to clarify, the, in the context of such an attacks, you don't learn a noise vector, at least not for this attack. What you do is that you inject a fault, actually, which gives you, uh, which gives you uh, some uh, uh, bad signatures that allow you to, to recover one oil vector. So let's thank the speaker and we go to the